We had decanite bombs and thermite. Decanite might have shattered valuable things, where the thermite seed would just loosen the ice. Dr. Copper, Norris and I placed a 25-pound thermite bomb, wired it, and took the connector up the tunnel to the surface. A hundred yards the other side of that granite wall, we set off the thermite bomb. We reached the side and found the metal was something we didn't know. Our beryllium bronze non-magnetic tools wouldn't touch it. The passenger of the ship wasn't prepared either, it appears. It froze within 10 feet of the ship. We cut out the animal in the block of ice, as you see, wrapped it and loaded it on a tractor for return here. The ice had melted somewhat in the heat of the room and it was clear and blue as thick good glass. It shone wet and sleek under the harsh light of the unshielded globe above. The half-terrorized howl of the dog pack changed into a wild hunting melee. The voices of the dogs thundered in the narrow corridors, and through them came a low rippling snarl of distilled hate. A shrill of pain, a dozen snarling yelps. Conant broke for the door. Close behind him, McReady, then Barclay, and Commander Gary came. One of the giant blowtorches used in warming the plane's engines was in his bronze hands. The dogs scrambled back from the three-foot lens of blue-hot flame. The smell of burnt flesh in the corridor intensified. Greasy smoke curled up. There was an acrid odor of singed flesh seeping out of it. A torn dog's leg with stiff gray fur protruded. That, for instance, isn't dog at all. It's imitation. Some parts I'm certain about. The nucleus was hiding itself, covering up with dog cell imitation nucleus. In time, not even a microscope would have shown the difference. The only hope that can come out is that nothing can come out. You didn't see me. I did it. I fixed it. I smashed every magneto. Not a plane can fly. Nothing can fly. His feet were fading echoes in the corridors as Dr. Copper bent unhurriedly over the little man on the floor. From his office at the end of the room, he brought something and injected a solution into Blair's arm. He might come out of it when he wakes up, he sighed rising. The blood, the blood will not obey. It's a new individual, the desire to protect its own life that the original, the main mass from which it was split, has. The blood will live and try to crawl away from a hot needle, say. McReady picked up the scalpel from the table. From the cabinet, he took a rack of test tubes, a tiny alcohol lamp, and a length of platinum wire set in a little glass rod. For a moment, he glanced up at those around him. Now, Van, suppose you be first on this. With a delicate precision, McReady cut a vein in the base of his thumb. Van Wall winced slightly. Then, held steady as a half inch of bright blood collected in the tube. Van Wall stood motionlessly watching. McReady heated the platinum wire in the alcohol lamp flame, then dipped it into the tube. It hissed softly. Well, Van Wall and Barclay are proven. I think then I'll try to show you what I already know, that I too am human. Thirty seconds later, Gary's blood shrank from the hot platinum wire and struggled to escape the tube. Struggled as frantically as a suddenly feral, red-eyed dissolving imitation of Gary. A curiously, fiercely blue light beat out of the cracks of the shack's door. A very low, soft humming sounded inside, the very sounds somehow bearing a message of frantic haste. McGrady's face paled. Lord help us if that thing has. On a table at the far end of the room rested a thing of coiled wires and small magnets, glass tubing and radio tubes. What is that? McGrady moved nearer. Norris grunted. Leave it for investigation. The bunk jammed against the door, screeched madly and crackled into kindling. One of its four tentacle-like arms 
looped out like a striking snake, like a blue rubber ball, a thing bounced up. Its line thin lips twitched back from snake fangs in a grin of hate, red eyes blazing. 